Welcome to Cyber Scotland Week's Cyberbyte session in association with Scotland IS. I'm Martin Smith, MD of Cyberprism, and I'm your chair for the next 90 minutes. Today's discussion is focused on the security of operational technology and IoT, threats, insights, and response. As we know, operational technology is crucial to production, can be risky to deal with, and requires the right qualifications and experience. I would suggest that it's still markedly less well understood than IT. Our speakers today are Keith Chappell, Technical Director at Cyberprism. We'll talk about industry issues with OT and vulnerabilities. Kean Walker, Strategic Account Executive for Security Technology at IBM. And he'll talk about response frameworks and tactics. And finally, John Murdoch, Business Development Manager at Celerity, will talk about identifying and remediating the security gaps. I'll ask each speaker to talk for up to 15 minutes, after which I'll get the discussion going based on your questions. So by all means, post questions in the chat as we go along. Let's start then with Keith. Okay, thank you for the, uh, for the introduction and thank you everybody for turning up. It's much appreciated. I think it's worthwhile starting off with a definition um, of what we mean by operational technology. Um, on the screen, this is Gartner's definition, uh, which I really don't like for a number of reasons. I think it's overcomplicated, um, and it also references enterprise, and obviously the word enterprise has got a number of IT connotations. I prefer a definition um, more like this, and I think the important thing about this de definition is that it includes operating correctly. Um, because for operational technology, uh, we take availability as a given. Um, but those systems, while they're operating, must be functioning correctly. We talk about IT uh, and OT convergence. Um, there's a number of problems with IT and OT conversions, convergence. Uh, the primary issue is that the IT guys only understand a tiny subset of the systems that we typically use in operational technology. So on the screen at the moment, you know, a list of uh, terms, technologies that you'll be very familiar with as an OT guy. Um, the stuff in red will mean absolutely nothing to the IT team. Um, these are all technologies, systems that they are unfamiliar with. It's important but we also understand um, that the IT priority stack, you have a famous CIA acronym, you know, confidentiality is king, doesn't really apply to the majority of operational technology systems. So once we get up to you know, layers 3.5 and 4 in the Purdue model, um, they, are, they, ha they have some applicability. Uh, and obviously, once we're in the enterprise network, they do apply. But for the majority of systems within the OT domain, um, the, you know, the conventional priority stack for IT just doesn't apply. This whole journey um, around specifying and understanding IT starts with procurement and design. And we see a lot of issues um, stemming right from the very outset. So for example, we see procurement officers buying the cheapest hardware, which might not necessarily meet the specification we need for operational technology in the belief that that piece of IT kit that's 50% cheaper than the, piece, the equivalent piece of OT kit um, is equally as good, which simply isn't the case. We see non-sensible um, clauses and specs in specifications for operational technology systems. We almost always see reference to ISO 27001. You know, that's not an operational technology standard, it's an information assurance standard, and it's really not appropriate when we're purchasing OT hardware. We see the wrong SLAs. Um, you know, it's a very different situation if your Outlook server isn't working. You know, you might be able to tolerate a few hours downtime. If your alarm server or your oil and gas panel isn't working, then you need almost immediate attention. So real, some real life examples um, that we've, we've seen recently. Um, we've seen a number of firewalls that have been specified by procurement guys in good faith um, that require a subscription to, to actually operate. Um, so we refer to these as firewalls that were turned into pumpkins at midnight. Should for any reason that subscription not be paid, your firewall ceases to operate. And by ceases to operate, we mean um, it doesn't turn into a pipe and just cease giving you protection. It actually turns into a block and you get no data for it at all. Um, we've even seen um, operational technology devices, you know, sold as operational technology devices and firewalls that operate in this way. 
Another example where procurement have unfortunately got it wrong, uh, where phone lines are used for connectivity to remote systems, whether that be ISDN or ADSL. Um, we, we've seen a couple of instances with the same uh, power station in the northeast of England recently, where the procurement guys didn't understand what a particular phone number was on the bill, so they stopped paying for it. Um, sometime later, um, the telecoms provider disabled that, uh, that phone line, and lo and behold, the emergency shutdown valve for a gas-powered power station ran shut. Um, and not only did they do it once, but they managed to do it twice. There's a lot of uh, confusion around um, standards. So, you know, obviously we have a whole raft of IT standards and a whole raft of OT standards. Um, when it comes to conversion, you know, we have many standards in IT, we have many standards in OT, um, which ultimately means in a converged system, we just have too many standards for any one auditor or assessor to get their head around. You really need a team approach to convergence um, and that those members of a team need to be sort of matrix trains. They need to understand a little bit about each other's domain, but still remain specialists. The confusion is um, made worse by vendor messaging. So we've borrowed this slide from uh, a vendor. I think it's fairly obvious who that vendor is. Um, you'll notice we haven't put our logo on the top of this slide because you know, we're not very pleased with the content of it. Um, this vendor seems to believe that anything above layer two um, can be considered to, as being IT. That's their annotation on the slide, which really means that in their eyes, they believe that the uh, Exchange email server has exactly the same priorities and importance as the plant alarm server. Uh, and obviously, you know, that just can't be true. There's a lot of uh, dependencies um, between systems that are often overlooked in operational technology. And, and this, this presentation may seem a little bit random, but it's intended to promote questions at the end. So um, lots of little points I want to touch on. Um, but, you know, when we come back to dependencies, unless you think like an attacker, so that really means red teaming or purple teaming, um, you will miss... Uh, a lot of dependencies between systems. Um, so some examples um, follow. So thinking like a red teamer, uh, we, we, we want to look at the attacker's perspective. So the bad guys like simple attack vectors. They don't particularly like to be getting the agent in anything overly complex. They're very patient. They'll do reconnaissance if they're serious about attacking you. They'd prefer to live minimal, minimal or no traces um, of their activities. They'd prefer to others to do their bidding, and they'd also be preferred. They'd also prefer to be remote from your site, um, so they, you know, they are less detectable. But these attacker behaviours provide us with some opportunities. So those opportunities um, include things like being able to identify dependencies. So if I'm an attacker and I want to create a denial service attack potentially at a data centre, it's very difficult for me as an attacker to actually hack into a data center. But it's relatively easy for me to find a manhole or um, a cover in the street, lift the cover, turn the water supply off, pour a bag of cement down the hole, chuck in a bucket of water, put the lid back on and walk away and wait for that data center to run out of cooling water. Um, that's a, you know, a, a fairly ridiculous example, but we need to think like, you know, how would an attacker take down my system? We have dependencies on um, internet service providers and mobile comms. You know, are there any remote services that require a heartbeat, like our emergency shutdown uh, valve uh, that we talked about earlier? Have we got dependency on particular power supplies? Um, the system may include UPSs, you know, designed in to keep systems alive, but do they give us sufficient autonomy to be able to recover our systems to business as usual before something? Uh, it goes wrong. You know, so would an, is an attacker more likely to attack a power supply to take out our OT system than try and attack the OT system? It's very likely he would. Can our contractors or staff be subverted? You know, are they are they having a hard time? Are they currently vulnerable? Um, how would we detect that? We very often see uh, people extending their operational technology all the way out to the fence line. Um, in order to install, you know, IP cameras for CCTV, CCTV, IP, CCTV cameras at the fence. Um, we see it a lot and it's really risky. You know, it's relatively easy to reach through, round, under a fence to get to junction boxes um, and get access to networks that haven't been properly isolated. We've got opportunities because of attacker behavior to actually detect the reconnaissance. Um, 
which can be really useful. You know, early reconnaissance detection allows us to provide additional defense in place before the attack actually happens. And we also have attack uh, opportunities to detect abnormal human behaviors. You know, we can monitor the demeanor and well-being of our staff. And I don't mean spying on them, um, but by, you know, team members keeping an eye on each other, looking out for each other, checking people are well, fit, healthy, mentally well. Um, we can, you know, very quickly identify if people are uh, are becoming vulnerable. There's lots of misunderstandings. I mean, the top one, you know, SCADA, um, there are, uh, I imagine most of you will have encountered seniors within your business that believe the SCADA system does control. Um, if your operational technology technologies, if your operational technology technicians actually believe that the SCADA system is going to control when you've got real problems. We regularly see when we have converged IT and OT teams, IT teams believing that they can use tools like uh, Nmap, Nessus, OpenVAS, etc., to probe the operational technology, um, often with disastrous, re uh, disastrous results. There's an awful lot of familiarity. You know, the networking equipment looks the same. You know, the IT guys believe that they can uh, deal with it. Many operational technology devices do not get on well with IT devices, especially those IT devices that create broadcasts broadcast traffic like exchange servers, operational technology devices was never, they were never designed to handle that additional traffic. And then we've got the issue of pen testing. Um, and we often see, you know, we see here expressions like, you know, our regular pen testers can scan the operational technology as well. Well, again, we've got, you know, significant issues with that. You shouldn't have a regular pen tester. You should rotate your pen testers regularly because they've all got a different perspective. And normal pen testing techniques, as we've touched on earlier, using tools like Nessus and OpenVAS and Nenmap, Burp Suite, etc., are very likely to knock over IT systems, let alone operational technology systems that are always more fragile um, and very often more important. I thought it was worth just throwing you know, uh, this graph in. Uh, we talk about pen testers and we talk about procuring pen tests. Not all pen tests are born equal. If you uh, ask your procurement guy to buy a pen test, he will probably buy a pen test down in the bottom left-hand corner of this graph because that's where it's cheapest. So that'll be a black box pen test where you provide literally the pen tester with just an IP address and say, go at it. If that's what you really want, then fine. But in reality, it's more likely that you would want a gray box test or white box test. We share a little bit more information with the attacker and you get much better scope and coverage from the results. People simply don't understand what they're procuring. So you need to help the IT guys. While we're on little graphics, this popped up on LinkedIn the other day. Um, this graph uh, reportedly tells us how long it will take to crack the hash of passwords for various technologies. Um, people see this data and think, oh, yes, uh, we'll look on the bottom there. I've got a password length of 10. It's going to take 7 hours and 20 minutes to cash to crack my NTLM password. That's simply not the case if you understand the table a little bit more. So two is two things to consider here. Right at the top, it describes the hardware that they've used to crack these hashes. 448 high-spec graphics cards were used to crack these hashes. That's a kind of nation state or organized crime level um, tooling. So in reality, you know, it would probably take much longer on average to crack these hashes. But also, as a pen tester, where we, you know, we spend quite a lot of time cracking hashes, um, it's important to realize that sometimes the attackers just get lucky. Um, so if you throw enough hashes at a cracking tool, some of them will be cracked much quicker um, than others. So although it's, you know, for, we'll take our 10, 10 character example, seven hours and 20 minutes to crack that, pa that uh, password. If I throw 30 passwords at it, it's likely that some will be cracked in minutes, some may be cracked in days, but I only need one or two to get into your system. Threats are increasing. We've all seen um, things in the press, particularly about you know, poisoning water supplies in the States at the moment. Um, I don't really want to get drawn into conversations about um, the use of TeamViewer on an operational technology site. I think if people are using TeamViewer uh, for remote access, then really they've got some uh, significant underlying security issues that need to be addressed. But we see these uh, attacks in the press all the time, and these, these attacks have consequences. And some of those consequences are really quite significant in terms of financial damage. On that note, uh, I'm going to hand back to the chairman. Um, I say, 
quite a random selection of things in the in the presentation. Only got a fifteen minute slot, but um, really we wanted to um, get questions from you guys at the end. Um, so I just wanted to put a whole load of seed material out there. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Keith. Uh, some really interesting points made there. The primacy of availability and operational technology comes across very strongly. The governance and procurement issues and the particular vulnerabilities of OT. Let's move on to Kean. Hi there, I'm Kean Walker. I'm in a, a strategic account executive with IBM Security in UK and Ireland. And I'm here to speak to you about securing your operational uh, technology systems and environments using a couple of frameworks and techniques. Just to bring you through uh, the agenda of what I want to speak to you about this morning, I want to speak first a little bit about impact-based risk, risk thinking, then some of the constraints on OT security response techniques, uh, especially limitations that are not available to OT security that would be quite traditional in IT security. Then I want to speak first about uh, the MITRE attack framework adapted for ICS. Then the second framework, the IEC 62443, adapted for OT and ICS security. And then just one small example uh, from recent IBM deployment uh, of thinking outside the box when securing and monitoring OT. So first of all, just as a sort of a, an introductory segue into the, the thinking that a lot of IT, OT security is sort of based on, is impact-based risk thinking. How outside of um, the academic sphere and outside of the classroom, how we really actually navigate uncertainty and make decisions in this space. So the first thing to realize is that non-academic risk pr practitioners don't really try to anticipate the, where the blows will land. They protect the parts that they can't afford to get hit. And while this might seem a very, quite obvious, this is actually the sort of the thinking that needs to go into designing your OT response uh, plans. Uh, there's a great quote from a, one of the maestros of, of risk, Nassim Taleb, uh, saying that to make a decision, you need to focus on the consequences, which you can know, rather than the probability, which you often can't know. And this is the central idea of uncertainty. Now, both consequences and probabilities can have a certain amount of opacity there, but usually consequences are more knowable than probabilities. So just to give a really, really basic example um, of how you might design a risk score against certain things that you want to mitigate against, is in a situation like this, um, the first line can be seen as significantly less likely to happen um, by, by your guesswork, but the impact is so much higher that it actually has a higher risk score. And again, outside of sort of the more academic spheres, looking at what is the worst that can happen um, as one of the dimensions, not just your likelihood, but your impact is the more important of the two dimensions when designing your risk score and designing which parts of your organization you really, really need to secure. What are the most catastrophic outcomes that, that can be seen and how best to shrink those attack surfaces? So just a couple of uh, constraints on the OT response techniques that you know, a lot of places where you can, for re various reasons, you can't shoehorn traditional IT security techniques because of the differences in this playing field. So the visibility into devices and the reliability of their output of data, logs, and um, network flows, stuff like that, and um, it just, it's it, there's less visibility. The data is often less reliable. The delineation of IT and OT management teams and systems, uh, there might be even political tensions between the two organizations there can, le can lead to extra risk. And the safety and reliability in production environments, the aggregation of data from multiple different facilities, and the often prohibitive cost of patching everything. All of these are cha challenges. But 
what we would identify as arguably the one biggest challenge in OT response is the fact that your most important and common remedial action from the IT security space is not available here. Devices and systems simply just cannot be taken offline without catastrophic consequences in a lot of cases, particularly in heavy industry or in the case of uh, life critical functions in hospitals and other healthcare units. So just a couple of sort of overviews of some of the figures from our recent research. 2019 saw a 2000 increase in OT incidents. And that is partly down to our better reporting on the area. Um, two thirds of experience a security incident related to unmanaged or IOT devices. And healthcare was the 10th most targeted industry uh, during the year. So, now I wanted to take us through two emerging OT response frameworks and um, suggested kind of playbooks for securing your industrial control systems. Um, the area is much more of an emerging area than IT security is. So these are still quite in their infancy from an OT security adaptation perspective, but they are um, the more they're more they're being played with, uh, the more they're evolving naturally and um, with the input of the actual practitioners in the field, which is something I find really interesting and cool about it. So MITRE ATT&CK for ICS, um, a well-known framework from the IT security space, but it it is evolving its own sort of parallel OT uh, framework at the moment. So similarly enough, it defines asset categories first of all control server, your data historian, engineering workstation, field controllers, the human to machine interfaces, input output servers, and your protection relays. And then it uses that to visualize um, sort of which ones are present in our network, in our environment, and which risks are associated with each asset type. It then like, again, traditional MITRE attack, it goes on to define 11 commonly seen attack objectives. And then under each objective, at this current count, there are 96 different categories of uh, attack techniques, if you like. Um, so they're all to be seen in the MITRE attack for OT. Um, and again, they're constantly being added to all the time. The practical application of this is uh, this framework is that it allows you to understand your threat behaviors. It allows you to create use cases for your SOC. Um, it, it shapes the training of your security teams. It uh, gives you standard language for terminologies and threats and adversaries so that your team can communicate with one another more effectively. Um, even just to label the different kinds of attacks and techniques more, more effectively. Uh, it speeds up your ability to work together. And it allows you to imagine your, what your adversary is going to do and test uh, your security controls and defenses against that. But again, my favorite thing about this technique is that it's down to you to contribute to, the, to its evolution. When you see uh, new kinds of attacks, new kinds of um, end results that your adversaries seem to be pursuing, you can add it to the community body of knowledge, um, which is constantly updated and validated by MITRE. So the next framework I wanted to talk you through was the IEC 62443, as it is being adapted for ICS and OT security. It is a very comprehensive uh, IT security manual, 14 sections and 1,000 pages, actually. So it's it's something that a lot of organizations aren't particularly in a, <laughs> keen to implement. But it could be argued that it is the most comprehensive of the frameworks out there. So it's obviously far too big and sprawling a framework for me to go through in any kind of high detail here. But there are a couple of um, high-level sections I'd like to parse out and talk you through. So the first thing it does is that it defines three different kinds of players, 
with three sets of responsibilities against each one. The facility owner and operator who's responsible for BCP and DRP, the system integrator is responsible for updates and service, and then of course vendors are responsible for the cyber resiliency of their technology components and softwares. It defines four security levels with associated goals against those SLs. So SL1, the goal is to prevent the unauthorized access of information and casual exposure. Um, SL2, the goal is to prevent the access of information when the attacker is searching for a victim um, using simple means with low resources and has low motivation. SL2, the goal is to prevent um, access of information when the attacker is using more sophisticated means and with moderate skills. Security level three is to prevent uh, that access of information when you're up against the best of the best of adversaries, perhaps um, nation states or institutional adversaries. It then goes on to de define seven FORs or functional requirements. Um, so the first one is based around identification and authentication control. The second is use control, which uh, enforces assigned privileges to authenticated users. Um, systems integ in integrity control deals with the verifying system conditions and the mandated operational and tech parameters that are within those prescribed limits. Um, functional requirement number four is around data confidentiality. Uh, to prevent uh, leakage and unauthorized disclosure. Restricted data flow is the functional requirement number five um, for controlling communicated data via zones and conduits. And then functional requirement six is based around timely response to events so that the earlier um, threats are mitigated, the earlier in the kill chain they're eradicated and the less risk there will be of a serious breach or successful attack. And then functional requirement seven is based around resource availability. It's aimed at ensuring uh, and verifying the availability of specific ICS functions. And finally, uh, last kind of section I wanted to speak about in it is the segmentation of zones and conduits. Again, a very important area with risk and probability when things are distributed and um, infections to one area don't take the entire ship down. So um, the idea is to deal with IT from all critical ICS assets because IT is connected to the internet. Then it segregates safely related assets which are controlled in addition. And um, then it segregates from the overall industrial control system all network parts and various devices using wireless connection. It further segments all temporary connected um, OT devices and computers because they might be infected prior to the connection. And then devices connected via external networks for remote access such as service computers uh, at external facilities. So that's just the, the last kind of primary section of this framework that I wanted to cover. Um, one very interesting use case I heard from our professional services OT experts recently was that just outside of a framework and just a more sort of improvisatory off the cuff sort of approach that I thought quite novel was there were a, a, a high number of ATM endpoints that they were responsible for securing and the cost of patching them all from Windows 95 or Windows XP, it just, there was no budget for it. It was not something that the client was willing to um, invest in. They just didn't see the, I suppose, the, the risk reward as being favorable. So what they did was they started monitoring the CPU usages across all of the ATMs um, to get an idea of what a sort of quote unquote normal amount of CPU consumption would be. And then they were able to very quickly target um, ones that were shown to have abnormally high levels of CPU. 
um, and make a better case for patching those and at least prioritizing um, the, the the patching sort of uh, time scale, if you like. So, you know, frameworks aside, it does always require that sort of creative thinking as far as is possible. And that's all I had for you today. Um, thanks very much for watching my presentation. Thank you, Kid. Okay, so now we're starting to look at the response framework and to take a closer look at some specific tactics. Very interesting, thank you. Now uh, on with our final speaker, John, can I ask you to lead off now? Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Welcome everyone. We hope you are having uh, an informative Cyber Scotland week and we thank you for your time and your interest in today's session. Uh, a short overview from me, I'm John Murdoch from Celerity. Uh, business Development Manager uh, covering Scotland and uh, Ireland uh, for Celerity. Quick summary on what we'll be covering here. It's about cyber threats insights, supporting and complement the tools that you have in place, and trying to assist and look at some of the stuff that Keith's identified as well, uh, insofar as remediating security gaps and the complexity of IT, OT, and the whole enterprise uh, that exists. But harsh reality, if we start with that, from a study last year, security breaches survey, 40%, 46% of UK businesses suffered a cyber attack in the last 12 months. This is just something that if it hasn't happened, it will happen to you. And the feedback from a number of market watchers is they believe the majority of companies out there, one way or another, have had a, a, a hack or a threat. So again, to position that and to uh, hopefully give some thought points, cover a current cyber threat landscape, some of the scary things that are out there, and some positioning on some of the tools that exist out there to allow you to try and get a, a bit of perspective on where you can point your resource and your time and the priority on where and how your cyber posture will be reacting uh, or being attacked from the, uh, what, what's actually out there in the, the, the real world. A little overview of uh, uh, Celerity Cyber Threat Insight, the service we push through and how that can actually complement all of the existing tools and protocols you have in place. And then just some suggestions and some thoughts at the end, which we'll probably pick up at the Q&A. So that is a quick agenda point. If we move on, some of the information that's out there in the market, just to put it in a context, I think that top one. Uh, just gives an indication that it's just growing, it's doubling uh, year on year. That's within the enterprise. We'll move on to the OTs as we slide down here. And I'm smiling because I think the OT one is just quite a, a, an eye-opener in respect to uh, how it's being perceived by the criminals out there as the new playground. So as I say, 2020, there's about 445 million cyber attacks reported doubling since uh, 2019, and I suspect if you take it back to 2018, you're on a hell of a curve actually going up the way. Second point down, that equivalent uh, is equivalent to 8.5 billion records breached. I sat last night, fired up a calculator and tried to get that down to how many per minute, and the figure was too big to actually try and squeeze onto this slide. It is a scary, scary number. You drop down to the next point, there are over 150, vulnerab 50,000 vulnerabilities disclosed today out there. That's the arsenal that sort of exists within the, the, the toolkits uh, for the uh, uh, criminals and the, the, the cyber uh, bad people that are out there. Ransom attacks up 67%. That seems to be the primary direction and way people are actually trying to get into your network. Phishing. Uh, uh, leading to a ransomware attack. That operational technology point at the bottom, I think, is a cracker. Attacks surged 2,000% year over year. Again, sitting last night, I'm trying to think to myself, that is some growth. The only time I've actually seen a growth like that, where somebody, pretty smart as he is, spotted it and exploited it, was when Jeff Bezos decided that, hang on a minute, it's the Wild West out there. That internet's growing at 2,000% year on year. Nothing's growing like that. So if you take a look at that and flip it, sadly, to the smart people that are the other side of the fence, they've identified that as a key figure as well. And they understand that OT is now the weak link within the chain of defences that you have. Calls for urgent improvement, we drop to the next one, specifically within NHS cyber. I'll broaden that out and say that's all, that is more across that critical infrastructure that exists 
and it is being floated at Parliament now that these are areas that need to be more robust. At some point, the legislation that's out there will get tighter, it will get pushed down heavier onto the board, which I don't think is a bad thing, uh, if, I, if I throw that out there. Again, 40% of IT security, line of business and data management uh, specialists, it's just getting more and more complex as organisations try to transform and drive further business value for their, their, their customers, their shareholders and everyone else. That again is identified as an area of, I wouldn't say weakness, but breakage within an organisation in respect to where those cyber uh, uh, umbrella uh, pillars sit and how that's actually umbrellaed with an overall cyber uh, strategy. They are very, very few and far between. Uh, we're finding the companies that actually have that integrated approach, a policy-based uh, uh, engagement to ensure that it's enterprise-wide, end-to-end, incorporating the transformational stuff at the edge, right the way back through to your traditional stuff in the DC. I think the, the next bullet down, operational technology from NCS. Uh, see, I took that from the, uh, the, the primary page on OT. I think that's an absolutely powerful impact statement. What would life be like without traffic lights, mass food, energy, or fuel? I think that just brings it all into context. I think it complements some of the things that Keith uh, stated at the start in respect to this isn't just about data being stolen, which is bad enough, respect to what it can be used for. This is about impact globally within your city, within a population, within a treatment plant, etc, etc. Again, Keith mentioned uh, the attack on the, the, the water facility. So it's at that sort of level of, of, of impact. Again, from Fortinet report, 9 out of 10 organisations have experienced at least one OT system intrusion in the past year, up 19%. Uh, you know, uh, there was three or more intrusions up to up 18% from 2019. Again, the typical engagement into your enterprise will just continue and that will be threatened, it will be attacked. It is now moving more and more into that extended enterprise, where as I say, you know, 2000% year on year uh, attack growth. It's an area to be concerned with, and I'm sure you all are, and it's an area to factor in to your overall uh, business strategy. Again, sadly, that links to the nearly 40% of IT, so it's a kind of self-fulfilling pr prophecy. If you continue to transform, drive the value and the benefit that you require to uh, keep the customers, as I've said, and support your business, you're just making it more and more visible, easier, if you like, uh, for uh, for breaches uh, and reconnaissance to be actually uh, done in the uh, in your network. So there are just some points to position it. Scary, scary landscape out there. How do you counter for 150,000 vulnerabilities? Eight and a half billion records being attached. How many is that? As I say, a minute, an hour a day. How many of those are yours? So how can we actually try and bring that into some context? How can we like, wrestle that down to something that you, you're going to focus on or allow you to focus a little better? A number of tools out there, number of studies, Keith mentioned a few of them, number of threat databases, number of intelligence-led databases to go to. And I've picked one, I picked the IBM uh, X-Force. Uh, I think X-Force is a, a, a strong threat database. I think it's one of the broader ones out there. However, there are multiple ones clearly from Cisco and everyone else that's out there. And all of the uh, uh, seams and the curators and the tools that sit and manage it all take feeds from the likes of these sort of tools to continually keep themselves uh, abreast of what's out there and continually trying to assist in, in defending uh, against that, that changing, changing market. The X-Force, I, I think, is quite a, a, quite a good one, quite a simple one to use, especially this particular version of it. Down the left-hand side, it's just giving you an indication across the, the, the countries of the sort of uh, percentage points and how they're being attacked what is being attacked, top industrial targets down at the bottom. And again, you can drive that down in country. So clearly we picked the UK, and again, by highlighting on the UK and Ireland, it will drop down. You can download the full report on the left-hand side there. But importantly, it's linking into things like the Micintar attack framework. So again, back to Keith's point, we know the sort of approach they take and the vectors and how they pre-exploit uh, is approached, et cetera, et cetera. 
So this again will give you an indication of the top threats hitting your, the, the region and then you can actually drop down into things like uh, industry and start to filter and focus to understand what that particular day, week, month, hour is the, the, the target vectors that will be hitting your particular industry. Okay, Keith pointed to, uh, out on some of the, the, the hash hacks that were happening. You know, this particular one here, the top threat group targeting this region, it's a nation state. So again, it is going to be heavy, powerful tools that are attacking you. People sadly with unlimited budgets and sadly people with one particular objective in the morning when they get up and that's to try and hack you. So again, these are decent, strong tools, good places to do to go to try and wrestle those 150,000, those eight and a half billion down into something that's got a bit of context and a bit of relevance uh, within your particular uh, your particular sector. Keith made the point a number of times as, uh, uh, as well, and I think it's a very, very strong thing. Don't think you can ever go wrong with throwing a bit of Sun Tzu in there. Always good for a debate, but know the enemy and know yourself. Understand how, what, and why they approach you. What are the tactics? What are they thinking? What is they're going, going through your mind? Again, drop to the bottom left. Cyber risk may be reduced and everyone is focused on it. All of the professionals we speak to care and passion uh, about all of this, rightly so we do. But this is part of an overarching strategy, an umbrella that needs to be developed. Anti-malware policies are strong, but they should form part of GCHQ, say, as defence in depth. And again, we're here to hopefully expand on some of the, the newer stuff that's out there to enhance and help uh, with the techniques uh, and the structures and the frameworks that you actually have in place. Then moving to the right bullet, knowing what the enemy it knows is key to your proper defence. Again, back to some of the points Keith said and as we've, we've run through the presentation about teaming, red teaming, etc. And getting those people in to approach it from an enemy point of view and within that mindset. So again, it's all about trying to address how and what and where those people are approaching you and attacking you and how you get into that particular mindset with them. Again, just to put back in, pull it back a little bit, 10 steps of cyber security from the National Cyber Centre. This is the basic framework that the majority of people will put in place and how they actually will try and just manage and get that cyber posture. Again, everyone I suspect on the call will know better than me and have deployed it. Sadly, have the battle scars in respect to actually deploying this stuff. Monitoring I highlighted specifically because I think monitoring is that overarching umbrella you need to start with. Whether it's just monitoring logs coming in, I'm trying to get a perspective on that, whether it's at that higher level where you have a, a seam sitting at the top, pulling together case management, access now into the threat databases, mapping that back into the MITRE framework and trying to actually do some of the heavy lifting uh, before you actually point the limited resource you have to try and address it. Now that's a fairly standard framework. Also through some investigation, National Cyber again, they put this, uh, there's a cyber assessment framework together specifically within the OT sector as well. So again, probably something the majority of people have looked at, assessed and have, have in hand. However, I don't want to presume this is all about awareness, keeping people up to date, trying to drive messaging and awareness out. I don't think you can have enough information hit you in this particular sector. I'd rather have it two or three times and not be made aware of it. So I thought that was quite a decent framework. I looked through it last night, puts a decent bit of structure, pushes forward, interestingly, some very hard questions that it, it feels need to be had at a board level. Do they understand the exposure of that, the integration of OT with the enterprise, bringing cloud complexity in it? Is it fully understand the exposure and how that impacts the risk posture. Is it fully understood that sadly the majority of businesses still work in a silo where OT will perceive that cyber is IT's issue to fix and budget and you end up going around that hamster wheel of madness with conversations and in most occasions sadly you still don't come out with what you would say is a, a comprehensive business-driven approach to how you actually uh, protect the enterprise, 
not just particular parts of it. So I would suggest potentially looking at that as a, a, as a complementary means to enhancing what you have in place. If we look at bringing that a, a, a little a, a broader, and if we focus that down, some of the, the, the techniques and tools that are out there to allow you to try and get into the mindset of, of a hacker, uh, of a, a, a nation state that's attacking you, by taking the, the information we have from things like the X-Force, and potentially try and understand the pre-exploitation on that, the exploitation tactics, and what post-exploitation uh, impact that, that, that may have on us. Tagulated, simple, uh, simple uh, you know, tagulated, simulated breaches, sorry, uh, identify the weaknesses in your posture. So set with that pre-exploitation, that's what Keith again referred to, they're testing, checking, seeing the perimeters, understanding how they can actually get in without leaving a trail. You're then dropping in and get into that exploitation mode. And again, it's not just a simple one vector attack. It's complex, multi-vector attacks that are designed to overcome the defences that are siloed within your, your, your potentially siloed within your organisation. So again, primarily if you're focusing on social engineering and potentially rogue engine, uh, insiders, those are typically the, 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 the two primary uh, vehicles that uh, the bad guys and girls use to get in. Once they've found it in there, once you've actually been socially engineered, once sadly someone may have clicked on that link, then you're into the, that post-exploitation phase where the lateral movement, they're jumping through your network, they're understanding where and how they can get through all those defences to get into the critical elements, whether that's coming in from your OT and landing to shut things down, do a sort of stuck, stuck net type attack, or whether that's actually jumping through your finance organisation, landing on your FD's desk and subsequently simulating threatening emails out to the employees about getting bills paid urgently or they're getting sacked. So it's those sort of things, they're fairly common and they are how, uh, the, the, typically how, uh, how, how things are actually happening at, uh, at this point in time. So Celerity can work with you. We have the tools, the capability. We can work that pre-exploitation attack. And the databases were access and have access to those 150,000 uh, uh, malware and threats in it. So what we're actually doing is attacking it with real live malware, payload removed, and indicating the blast radius that can be achieved. Real empirical data, graphically shown, where you could sit with the board and say, this is the impact. This is how they spread. This is how they get past the defences. And this is the damage that's actually coming. So you are getting into that mindset. You're approaching it. Sun Tzu says, know your enemy. You're approaching it with that approach. You're approaching it as a bad person. And you're following exactly the pre-exploitation, exploitation, post-exploitation post -exploit tactics they will be deploying. All of those simulated attacks, Again, feedback and take guidance out of things like the MITRE framework. So again, it's how the bad people will be thinking. We are doing exactly the same, attacking it with that and enhancing or giving the, the, the additional information to potentially enhance your, your posture or understand where those threats and exposures are in relation to what is targeting your industry within your country. Again, the threat insight itself, both internal and uh, uh, internal and external. Sorry, more and more is moving into the cloud. More and more is getting complex. More and more of the OT is integrating in. People are trying to exploit all of those areas. So if you're trying to think like a bad person, again, it is all about external and internal. And we start that initially with the vulnerability scan to understand where and how the the bad people would be attacking it and what information they currently have that's the same as your, yourselves. So we start with the vulnerability scan, gives us that, we then move into the, 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 the exploit pre-exploitation exploitation phases. Then it's about continually managing your vulnerability against your posture. Pen test, one time hit, vulnerability scan will give you that perspective. The bad people are continually evolving and thinking of that. So this is about continually working with you with these sort of new techniques and tools that are out there to understand as you expand that OT network into the enterprise and bring more and more of an integrated business together where those gaps are in your posture, 
and how you can actually potentially best uh, uh, mitigate against those with the resource and the budget that you have. All of that leads to, from Gartner, uh, trying to ensure the urgency is created, sorry, the urgency to treat cyber security as a business decision. That's something that needs to be driven up at the sea level. And again, there's a lot of tools and techniques out there that, that can uh, assist in how you actually present that and try and change the thinking to ensure that it's a, a business-led decision and that it's treated with the same level of importance as, as those critical business transformation decisions that are being made. Some thought points, as I say, just it's about making sure you have that service-driven model, that end-to-end -end understanding to ensure you can recover, respond, detect, protect, identify. I probably should have done that the other way around. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And as I say, there are complementary tools out there that will allow you to get into that mindset and ensure that you're enhancing your posture based on what is seen by the, the hackers out there. Thank you for your time. Hopefully some of the points we've delivered will create some, some good discussion at the end. Apologies, I think I may have ran over on that. Thank you very much for your time. I'll hand back to Martin, and as I say, I hope you have a, 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 an enjoyable rest of the week and an informative Cyber Scotland week. Thanks for your time. Uh, well, John, thank you. Some frightening attack statistics there related very specifically to operational technology. Governance again. Do boards really understand? And if you're going to be uh, countering this sort of threat, you've got to be thinking like an attacker, something I learned in the Royal Marines. Now, that is the end of our speakers for today. Uh, but please stand by as we go to the live Q&A session. I hope you found uh, those presentations interesting um, and we await your questions. Thanks for your comments, uh, especially the positive ones uh, and the ones on Keith's beard. Um, and I can announce that the winner of today's buzzword bingo competition is John for getting Sun Tzu into his presentation twice. And apparently I owe him a beer for that. Um, that's great. Um, while we wait for the questions, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, one of our speakers couldn't be with us today. Um, Tommy McCarthy from OSP Cyber Academy um, has had to stand down because of illness. So all the best to Tommy for a speedy recovery. Okay, please get your questions in. I'd like to start a discussion across the panel. So I'll throw one in to start with um, while you're typing. Um, I'd like to ask about um, security uh, and what we might term real security and the difference between that and compliance. And I suppose the question is, do our current compliance systems give us that real security that we can trust or is there still a gap there that needs to be covered? Um, and let's go through an order. I'll, I'll um, pose that one to Keith, please. Okay. I, I think... The problem with any standard with which you're trying to be compliant is that standards are designed to be widely applicable and no two operational technologies, uh, no two operational technology systems are identical. So there needs to be a degree of interpretation um, uh, and adapting standards to suit individual circumstances. There's also a risk with standards that people um, commercially will do the least they can to be compliant rather than exhibit best practice. And I think there's some good examples in the States of where uh, legislation has been introduced and it's actually reduced um, the cybersecurity um, posture of businesses. Thanks, Keith. Um, would anyone else like to pick up on that? Kian, can I ask you for your comments? I could, um, I'm obviously very much coming from a sort of technology point of view here, um, but I will say that what we feel at IBM is a differentiator with our technology is the fact that our platforms apply offense rule uh, scanning to data um, coming, like flow and event data coming into the platforms at source as opposed to after the fact. 
Um, and that is what we would feel is the main differentiator with making our technology designed from the bottom up to be threat detection technology rather than sort of repurposed business intelligence technology. Um, and that, that to us is what makes the difference between a sort of a security tool and a compliance tool. Uh, you know, the difference between actually detecting threats and having a, a history of uh, the attack chain after it happens, if you will. That's great. Thank you very much, Ken. John, any comments from you? Uh, yeah, we, 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 we find, and I've got a couple of customers, again, depending upon whether it's public sector or, or uh, industry, but a few of them have looked at the sort of policy and, and the things they need to tick off to ensure they conform to that policy or you know, that ISO standard, whatever it may be. And the practicalities of some of the things they're checking don't actually come in, from a real-life point of view, have no impact. One of them's got a couple of Windows servers sitting absolutely void of the network. It holds data uh, from a historical point of view. However, they continually fail and get pushed back because they haven't run a full assessment against that, to which the head of transformation keeps saying, but... It's not connected to anything. It sits there. We can, yeah, but it doesn't matter. It's part of the policy process you've got to go through. So they are finding that there are the, the, the realities don't kind of conform. And I think that was a point that that, that that kicked about. You know, how how do those policies and procedures actually uh, map across the reality? In some occasions, you're doing work, investing time and effort in something that's it's not applicable or is hundred percent air gapped or just is not required in respect to uh, keep yourself clean. So it's a bit of a minefield. Uh, oh, and, that, and as we said, people, sadly, human nature will force yourself to get away with a minimum, especially from a spend point of view. Have we ticked all the boxes we need? Good. Let's move on. And it's sometimes maybe prioritizing the feeling of safety over actual safety. Yeah, and I'm guessing that you know, certainly where you can, you'll see it in your interaction with boards. I think this can be very difficult at board level um, because boards can sort of handle compliance, I think. You can have a five-minute conversation with a board uh, over whether you've made Cyber Essentials uh, or NISD, NISR, um, but you're going to have a one-hour conversation about real security and what the real parameters are and the real threats are, and that's much more difficult for a board, uh, the members of which might not be particularly technical, uh, to understand. So I think, you know, we're, we're going to be living with this gap for some time and we've just got to encourage people to think security, not just compliance. Um, right, I've got a question from David Bosworth, um, and it's this. There has been a lot of discussion today of thinking like an attacker. It seems to, to me that we should be spending most of our time here generating the response plans against things like MITRE, etc. What are your thoughts? Um, shall I go to Kian first? Yes, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a cracker of a framework and it's being adopted more and more across the market. Um, it's great to see the o OT and ICS one um, uh, emerging as well. Um, there's a huge gap in the market in terms of response plans there's a huge amount of uh, detection use cases with no uh, corresponding response uh, plays. Um, and there are a couple of our most sort of advanced clients that we work with, our most competent ones, are starting to implement rules where there are, there, they, they will not allow for a detection use case to be built without a corresponding response plan. And so they kind of, they're sort of bi-directional in the way that they, they flow. So that's a really interesting one to see. But certainly um, it's something that just needs to become really, really standard. Yeah, very understandable. Um, Ken, John, can you add to that? Yeah, uh, it, it certainly. I, again, a lot of the customers we speak to just in, uh, in parallel to any other conversation will be looking at things like the MITRE attack framework. We'll be looking at the NCS guidance in respect to the, the process and the procedures that go in. Uh, it's a, 
it's a very very strong place to go and I, you know it's it, it, everyone that's sitting listening the security professionals out there will 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 be visiting these places and understand where the threat databases and various other things are but i think my again just allows you to put that framework around uh linking it with something like an x-force to say well these are the threats that are coming in their nation state what and how are those actors you know working what's the thought process going through them so at least it brings it into some sort of structure to allow you to understand that and then potentially focus on where and how you need to address things as opposed to just looking and going well, there's 180,000 180 million out there what ones how what what's the thinking what's the processes and the procedures so I think as I say try and wrestle that down using something like my as an excellent way of, of, of doing it. It's an industry standard. The baddies are using it. The goodies are using it. So, again, it's allowing some of those threat insight tools to have that targeted approach because it's got those starting points, how the actors are thinking, what the vectors are, you know, what, what they're actually attacking. So it's, it's like all of these things, sadly, it's complementary and will enhance the thinking the posture and where you are within that 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 cyber journey. I don't think there's an answer that's going to f fix it, but the, these are the these areas are, are areas we find our customers are going more and more on a daily basis, just to understand the day, the threat, the priority, what 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 may be coming in. So they're excellent excellent places to go, but like everything. It's about complementary any of the challenges within your business, the priorities within your business, potentially that transformational journey that you're you're on as well. So you know, building cyber, designing cyber from the ground up, might uh, might attack framework and other things are strong tools to be using to actually b build that as you transform. Thanks, John. Yeah, Keith, anything to add? Just, just very briefly, I, I think it's important to remember that. Um, everybody's sites, everybody's processes are different. So the MITRE ATT&CK framework is a good set of pointers. Um, but I think a lot of people are reluctant to add their own categories uh, and entries into the MITRE framework. There's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be tailoring it, tailoring it for your own organization and your own processes. Uh, and in doing so, you'll get much more value out of it than just adopting a standard uh, framework. That's a bit, uh, bang on, Keith. We find everyone is trying to complement it in. Uh, and you know, if, if you like plug gaps, it's wrong English, Scottish, Welsh, or Irish to use, but just uh, uh, understanding that posture better and based on that structured framework, where those gaps may may be. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, yeah, attackers will be dedicated to overcoming your framework. So I guess frameworks are a bit like maturity models; they need to evolve got to have a framework, got to have a basis for doing what we do, but it's got to keep up with the threat as well. So that sort of rapidly evolving framework seems to be the, the model that we need to be thinking about. Um, yeah, and, and, uh, and equally, um, maturity models, maturity levels need to be assessed almost constantly. So if you're assessing your cyber maturity against a set model once a year, you're going to be very vulnerable um, for about 51 weeks of that year. More automated systems that can provide almost a sort of constant update on, on your level, your level of compliance and maturity level would appear to be the, the way ahead, I think, to us. Okay, I've got uh, a question from Nick McLaughlin, if I scroll it up. Um, are there any thoughts that large organizations have an, will often have an IT security practitioner at board level? Um, but very few organizations that are industrial based have an OT security practitioner on the board, someone who understands the link between safety and cyber risks. John. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I think it's mixed across. Can I, can this is the problem with all of Scotland being logged on for Cyber Week. The internet up here might get a little bit shaky. So uh, on the basis, we are still connected. And Martin looks as if he has frozen, or as I say, he's back in one of those commando poses where he's still. Uh, sorry, what was the question? 
I threw that much abuse at Martin. I forgot what the question was. Sorry, Martin. Well, while Martin's struggling, um, I'll just repeat that for you, John. The question was from Nick, um, and it was about uh, many organisations have yes. got IP representation at board level, but not OT. Uh, yeah, we are we are certainly finding a split across it, and more and more of that is going on to under either the IT director or the CISO, uh, where they're having that triangle down, where they're in charge of all IT, and they're now they're getting OT put onto their uh, uh, table as well. We haven't specifically found at a board level where there is someone with that OT hat. Typically, we're finding operations at a board level are getting more and more integrated into that IT conversation and thinking as part of an integrated team. But we are certainly not finding, because the majority of companies, whether it's small, medium or large, that they have somebody with that responsibility and ownership within an OT point of view. It is getting, it's becoming more and more prevalent that it does need that level of ownership. But I don't think there's been somebody identified as the person who's whose door would get chapped at three o'clock in the morning if they were hacked down. That all still seems to be pointing up to the CIO, the IT director of the CISO. Okay. I don't know if Martin's back with us. Uh, he looks frozen on my screen, so um, maybe I should just read out the next question that's come in from Barry, um, as it appears to be addressed to me. Uh, coming from a more conventional counterterrorism environment, uh, apologies for a na uh, naive question. Presumably OT systems are becoming increasingly developed with largely wireless connectivity, how will this affect vulnerability? Um, to, to address Barry's uh, uh, question, I, I think we should consider Wi-Fi as an enabler. Um, it's certainly a cost reducer. It great, creates a great deal of flexibility. And there's no reason to be afraid of Wi-Fi done properly. Um, if, we're you know, if we're encrypting our data in flight um, appropriately, um, there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be using Wi-Fi, especially multi-path Wi-Fi and mesh networks um, for OT uh, connectivity. There's some fantastic standards out there, Wireless Heart and others, um, that allow us to do this both safely and securely. I think the risk comes when people rush to use um, commercial IT-based Wi-Fi solutions in the OT environment without fully understanding the risks. Um, Kim? sort of tacked on on top without sort of addressing some of the underlying um, patching problems and stuff like that when it's just added on as a sort of a bolt-on component. Um, but that's not to say that it's sort of problematic in itself. It's sort of more that uh, something that may not have been so accessible over a network before, um, and that was a, a sort of a saving grace for it, now is, I think, is, is what you're, you're getting at, Keith. Indeed, indeed, uh, and you know, I think we need to we need to embrace wireless, uh, but do it do it uh, securely and appropriately. It's uh, but it, Gartner and NCS again. Harken back to some of those uh, uh, comments is about that overarching policy, you know, enterprise wide driven approach, where Wi-Fi is a fundamental part of a transformational uh, agenda, uh, and again, it's about. In, pulling that in and getting that from a, 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 a policy point of view correct. I think home working is bringing its own set of challenges into it. When you've pushed people out of your DMZ and out, your, uh, out of your data centre and pushed them to home, I've got my wireless switch there. It does have a 25-character password on it because my boy set that up for me. But how many home switches are now sitting where you're accessing your corporate network and it doesn't conform to policy or it's the default or... It's open, so as that's transformed and pushed out, I think it's spot on. It has brought a whole different level of complexity in thinking, and it's the weak link, that pre-exploitation places where they will be checking all of that out and understanding if there's weak, weak passport policies down there. Sadly, there was an example hit the press yesterday with all the uh, nursery cams, uh, if people had seen uh, that particular one. So again, that's path of least resistance. That was an easy route in uh, as they identified through that pre-exploitation and then you're jumping through uh, uh, the network and working your way through it. So it's, uh, it's, it, it, it is one of those points that does, as Keith said, it can be done correctly, but it needs to be elevated back up as part of that overall, overall strategy 
not just looked at as well. We've got a number of Wi-Fi points up about the place. We're all okay. Keith, you still there? Uh, yeah, do you, uh, <laughs> we've got another question from uh, from Lee. Um, Lee's a fellow pen tester. Um, I know Lee. Uh, Lee Lee's asking um, in, in quite a long question, but it, it boils down to. Uh, using advanced techniques and AI to automate uh, response um, on threat detection um, and whether we feel that that approach would be appropriate for operational technology. Um, I guess I'll just kick that off. Um, you know, I, I believe that absolutely um, automated response to OT threats um, and vulnerabilities to some extent is coming. Um, we already have some degrees of AI feeding into this. Um, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be human moderated, and the real risk with any AI system is that it learns bad behaviours as well as good behaviours. Um, so I think we'll always have humans in the chain. Uh, Kian, your thoughts? Just I suppose that the, the buzzword holy trinity of people, processes and technology, I think they come in that order of importance. And as uh, Lee rightly points out, I think the, the need for constant wargaming and constant you know, doing um, to sort of sharpen that muscle memory, as he says, is, is so, so important. Yeah, I don't, think, I don't think you'll get away by taking the carbon element out of the equation, as Keen says, you know, people process technology, if you look at it in that order. Uh, you know, be, be, best will in the world, to, you know, all things developed by humans have inherent flaws built into them. Uh, it's just their nature, as we have inherent flaws built into us. So AI, as you say, you know, it's a, it's about ensuring it's right practice as opposed to wrong one. You, know, you read some of the stories out there about people manipulating uh, some of the uh, algorithms uh, in, in relation to Facebook and being able to jump through and publish things that they shouldn't, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, you can always false you can always overcome or work your way uh, around that i think ai absolutely has its place for doing a lot of that heavy lifting and filtering the noise the huge amount of noise that sadly actually comes in and distracts uh the professionals the cyber people that you know people defending the uh the, the realm the nation uh, and the business i think ai absolutely has its place however it, it's as you it, it's a bit tempering it correctly with the other tools, techniques, uh, and the experience that you just can't buy of the people sitting watching things coming in. It has you know, no discernment, John, I think, is the, its biggest sort of weak point. It just has no human discernment. doesn't really know what it's dealing with. That's a zero and a one, and you'll get a zero and a one outcome, uh, output, uh, you know, as, a, as opposed to the experience looking at the nuances of what and how things may be coming, mm, that doesn't quite fit with how it should be happening. Somebody's obviously tweaked that variant a little, so, you know, it's it, it's it's that sort of thing. Uh, I think what, what AI does provide us with is an opportunity to unburden the wetware um, to actually focus those skills more appropriately in in maybe monitoring uh, moderating the AI output rather than actually doing the doing. Yeah, uh, you know, use AI for detection, use uh, humans for triage um, and response. So, yeah, that, that 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 heavy yeah. lifting to filter the noise down to to the correct sounds uh, that you should be listening to, Keith, as opposed to it just being the noise. Yeah, bang on. Because otherwise, you're you're wasting analyst time copying pasting things like file hashes or, or email addresses from one tab to another and looking into all these data sources when, again, the analysts should be used for their human discernment, not not for all these kind of data lookups, I suppose. Yeah. And I, I think, if anything, you know, the, the bad guys are ahead of the defenders from the, uh, the use of AI perspective. You know, the bad guys are already <laughs> intelligently capturing hashes, pushing them out to hash cracks services, identifying you know, the best way to do that, getting things back. You know, they're automating so many of their processes to reduce the burden on the attackers. You know, we, we should be following a similar approach as defenders. I, 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 I summer I heard coming out of a BI conference uh, uh, I was at, and it's absolutely applicable to this because we're talking about data, and it's about getting uh, from data to decision point quicker. With that volume of data and noise that's coming in, using AI to actually group, 
patch filter will allow that data to decision point quicker uh, in respect to what defences you need to uh, tighten or how you actually need to react at that point in time to what's happening live in your network. So I think it's about that data to decision point. And once you get to that decision point, it's, it's, it's a carbon input, it's the human being uh, 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 assessing and understanding that and subsequently putting the right priorities on it based on the threat to your business at that point and your journey, et cetera, et cetera. But data to decision and the heavy lifting. Yeah. Converting data to information. Precisely, yeah. I don't think we've got any more questions in the chat. Um, Ma Martin, have you frozen? Yeah, Ma Marvin, uh, Martin has uh, IT issues. John, uh, could you provide closing remarks? I, 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 I certainly can. Uh, to start with, clearly from all the speakers, even the ones that were ill and uh, didn't bother to uh, turn up, we, we thank you for your time and uh, your effort. We do appreciate uh, the, the job everyone does, the focus people have on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure they are protected. So uh, uh, your time is absolutely uh, appreciated. We thank you. Uh, hopefully it has been informative. Just to close off, the four partners on here, Celerity, uh, Cyber Prism, OSP and IBM, uh, across the four elements we've covered, we have pulled an offer together for uh, those that attended and for all Scotland IS members as well. Uh, so we will be publishing the offer. It's a you know, offer of some services seriously reduced. It's an offer of some of the frameworks out of IBM. It's an offer of a, 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 a cyber threats insight from ourselves to get you that position to assist on your your, your, your posture. Now, we do appreciate uh, a number of people will have ticked, yes, I'm happy to receive marketing. We do appreciate a number of people will not have, have ticked that. So we will drop an email out to all, thanking everyone with the offer and the link on it. But you will not be flooded with marketing uh, and or follow up if you have ticked that particular box. Uh, however, if you do receive an email through, it's nothing other than a, a thanks, a link to the offer or the PDF that's on it. If you feel it's something you would like to, to take up, please get back to any one of the uh, uh, contacts that will be on the, uh, the document. Uh, I think that is us. Uh, again, our thanks from, from all. Uh, time absolutely appreciated. Please, if there's any questions, follow-ups, if anyone would like a, a further one-on-one -on -one kick about, please don't hesitate to come back to any of the uh, uh, speakers here or go to your preferred uh, partner, whether it's us or Cyber Prism, if you have the relationship. On that note, I will thank all the speakers uh, for their time and their effort. Uh, and as I say, have a good day, everyone. Be safe and our thanks again. Thank you.